and get started. Glad to see there are some more uh, faces in the room. Glad people could make it, come in. Uh, so again, as Renata mentioned at the beginning, my name is Shannon McKean. I'm with the University of North Carolina, and I'm the new deputy director of the South Big Data Hub. So like some of you, I'm learning a lot, and hopefully I can learn something from those of you that have been involved for a long time. This next panel um, and presentations are about the spokes, some of the activities and the research that's been happening under the Hub's umbrella uh, and NSF over the last uh, four years. So we have six speakers and we'll follow a similar format to the earlier panel where each speaker will come up and talk about his or her research and then at the end we'll bring them all up and you can ask them questions. The one exception being the first gentleman, uh, Gary Clifford, who's going to talk about large-scale medical informatics for patient care coordination and engagement from Emory University. He has another engagement, so if you have questions for him, you'll make sure you need to ask him uh, during his presentation. Gary, thank you. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Good. All right. Um, I, um, I'll be back in the afternoon as well, so I'm, I'm yo-yoing between Emory and Georgia Tech, which is a good metaphor for the fact that I also have a position at Georgia Tech and um, also at Morehouse as well. So um, that's a, it's a good um, analogy or a, a good um, representation of what we do in, in Atlanta. So we're always working together, always working across um, the borders and trying to leverage the different strengths of the institution. So I'm really proud to be part of all of the different ones. Um, let's see. Yeah, here is my slides. So. Um, I'm, uh, this is a PI on the ground with uh, Dr. Herman Taylor, who's a, um, the director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute at uh, Morehouse School of Medicine. And um, he's formerly the uh, director of the um, Jackson Heart Study. Um, and I've been very lucky to work with him over the last uh, three or four years. And also with uh, Dr. Bardnil, who uh, is also um, one of the co-PIs on the grant. Um, uh, from Texas, and uh, we've been working together on this for uh, about two and a half years now, and we're starting to see uh, the fruits of our labor. So I'm just going to talk very quickly through some of that and then just open it up for questions. Okay, so the overview is that um, heart disease is, um, is an enormous killer, as we know, um, but it's, as you can see from the map, disproportionately affecting us in this stroke belt region. So uh, the southeast of the United States is getting worse and worse over time in terms of its proportional burden on heart disease. Um, one of the things uh, that's particularly difficult with heart disease, of course, is that um, it's a long-term problem and it's cumulative behaviors and cumulative exposures. So um, when we first talked about doing this project, uh, Dr. Taylor came to me and said, I'd like to do something similar to the, heart, the Jackson Heart Study, but I'd like to do it um, in a modern way through cell phones and try and do um, a ubiquitous way of monitoring people's behavior and exposures over time to see its effect on cardiovascular disease. Uh, but just using the devices that we already have in our pockets, so in other words, cell phones or any other IoT type devices that we have, so any smart watches or whatever you can link into this. The key though is that the burden is disproportionate on uh, low socioeconomic uh, income groups and disparity populations and in the southeast particularly, that means particularly Hispanic groups and um, African Americans. And so one of the problems there is that there's a history of distrust with the researcher and with, um, with the United States, we we're all pretty familiar with things like Tuskegee and other incidents where we've lost the trust of um, the populations that we're trying to serve. And so the key here was how do we create a framework that would engage the population that we wanted to work with in a, a way that, we could, that they would trust what we were doing. So one of the key things about the whole project is that the entire app that, uh, and cloud infrastructure that we're building for monitoring cardiovascular behavior and, and symptoms is open source and it's also co-developed by the populations that we're trying to serve as well. So we actually train programmers from the communities to become part of the project and to inform what goes into the, into the infrastructure and also to learn how to understand it. It's disingenuous to say to somebody, here's some open source code uh, with a community and then not teach them how to read it. It's like me publishing my scientific research 
in Chinese or Arabic and you're not a Chinese and Arabic speaker. And I say, look, there are my results. You can see for yourself that it all makes sense. So the point is that we want to engage the communities and co-develop the whole infrastructure with them. So this is a large part of what we're trying to do and we've done this through a series of workshops. The goals are to find, provide a human-centered approach for integrating electronic health record data with data in the wild. So we're also incorporating EMR data through smart FHIR protocols. Uh, develop methods and a framework for evaluating accuracy of the data. So that's a key element to this. You'll find that most of the data going into electronic medical records as well as ambulatory data that you capture in the wild is largely noisy. Uh, most of the stuff that you'll, if you've got an Apple Watch or whatever uh, device on your arm and you walk around with it and you use it to measure your heart rate, you'll find most of the time it's reporting an inaccurate heart rate if you ever compared it to a real cardiac device. It's mostly just guessing what your heart rate is based upon your physical activity. So one of the things that we wanted to build into this was a framework for understanding and knowing when to trust the data and when to discard it. We're also creating, as part of this, a cloud-based infrastructure to allow the data to be uh, stored in the cloud, analyzed in the cloud, and collected in a scalable way. Uh, if you try and collect this all through uh, one Ethernet port, um, one IP address at one university, you're doomed to not be able to scale this. So the key is building a scalable infrastructure that's um, abstracted away from any bare metal technology. And then most importantly, provide an educational and community uh, focused outreach initiative to empower the community and the participants. And that's the real key part of this that um, I think that we've, we've really pushed um, on, uh, on a day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month basis. So um, <clears throat> part of the, the things that fell out of um, the design process was we would meet with groups uh, from the communities every, uh, every few months and we would have workshops that would last one, two or three days. And we would have them co-design parts of the application with us and suggest things that they would like to see in, the, in the, the app itself that they would find engaging and useful in their everyday lives. One of the things that um, we started to develop as part of this was to look at um, access, this was never really part of the grant right at the start, but it's something that fell out as we went through this project. One of the things that the communities identified as really important was access to good food, good quality food, and uh, healthy as well as uh, tasteful food, something that they would enjoy eating, um, and also affordable food. So we started to build um, a, into the app a way of identifying just what the quality of the food was in your local neighborhood. And we used uh, food desert maps from the CDC, and we integrated them with a crowdsourcing approach to pulling um, the information about the quality of various restaurants and uh, grocery stores around Atlanta, and built a whole new high-resolution food map out of that. And you'll be able to see the, uh, everything I'm presenting here, by the way, is also part of a series of posters that my team will present later this afternoon and this evening. Put your hands up, guys. These are the people doing all the real work over here. And um, if you want to see and really hear about each of these different parts of the project and, and how they're actually coming to fruition, these guys will have nice posters and they'll run through it with you in detail. So we have this um, uh, ability to tell people how food deserty your location is. At the same time, we're pulling uh, local pollution and weather because these affect your day-to-day -day behaviors. So I was just showing somebody this morning how um, over the last few weeks the amplitude of my activity has been getting higher and higher and higher. And that's not because I've been getting healthier and healthier and healthier and I'm feeling better and better and better. It's because the weather's been getting better and better and better and I've been taking the bus less, I've been cycling more, and there's a natural um, modulator that comes from the environment. So having information about the environment is really important. So we pull this in real time. But of course, local pollution will affect also your day-to-day uh, your -day activities and also uh, local pollen rates might affect you. Um, and then your ability to access healthy food is also going to have a long-term cumulative effect. So we're pulling all of these parameters in real time. Um, <coughs> We also do uh, mood reporting, vital sign tracking, integration with wearables, 
EMRs, social network monitoring. And what I mean by that is actually looking at the size of your real social network. Um, so looking at how do we, um, how many people are we communicating with at any given day? How wide and uh, varied is that social network? And when does that start to cr contract and collapse? We do all this in a completely de-identified way. We never collect any information on who you are, who you're talking to, uh, where you are, uh, and what your actual um, activities are or what you're saying about your activities. It's all completely privacy preserving. What we're looking at is just de-identified versions of the data. Um, we've created this web cloud application. Um, so we have uh, a bunch of web applications like the food desert, um, and we push our data up to it, pull um, the, so if you're wondering how we, uh, how we collect information on local weather and food deserts when we don't store the actual location of where somebody is, we pull that information in real time and then discard the location after we've got that information. And we only keep relative locations. And from this information, we then build models of, uh, of different individuals' behaviors and one of the uh, prices you'll see this afternoon is some preliminary results on a, a CHF population, a heart failure population, where we're showing that we're able to um, uh, identify the severity of illness from the Kansas City Cardiac Myopathy Questionnaire with a 5% error rate. So we're getting within five points on a 100 point scale of being able to identify how well somebody's feeling without actually asking them any questions. It's just from their actual data from their mobile phone. And it's using this infrastructure. So there's some really nice work being done there. Um, we're also, uh, very importantly, working in a lot of training and community outreach. So every three months we have sessions where we, uh, we work on training and we work on integrating ideas from the community and building up the infrastructure around the system to suit the community. And then, um, the, uh, the four research publications that have come out of this so far, um, looking at uh, free text analysis in a de-identified way, that's work with Ahmed Abassi up at uh, UVA. Um, we've also done some work on this heart failure readmission prediction that I was just telling you about. Uh, we've been doing some editorials on disparities in AI that have come out of this work, um, and also on the food desert mapping, which is, uh, is in progress. Um, so finally, uh, about collaboration opportunities. We're really keen to share this with the community uh, at large. Um, the whole system is open source, so we're, we're hoping to share the code with other people to use. Um, we're interested in what other extensions people can make to this particular infrastructure to adapt it for other health monitoring um, uh, scenarios. Um, and we're looking at other um, APIs that we can build into it as well, because there's just no end of things that you can pull from web APIs if you have location information um, on your phone and you can pull the information. Um, we're also working on building some programs that, um, in data science and health literacy. And we're just at the start of this, learning from the communities of what we can incorporate in this. But um, we're starting to build front-end applications now that will help people explore their own data. So one of the key things to this project is that we want people to see what data we're collecting from them and then learn how to manipulate that data. So when I say data science, I mean that in a very simple way initially. I'm not talking about people putting all of their data from their smartphone into TensorFlow and then trying to predict whether they're gonna have heart failure in 25 years. I'm talking about people um, trying to see that, uh, you know, there's a strong correlation between um, the time that I spent um, in the gym this week and um, uh, the kind of food that I ate the, ne the next week, that it, it had a positive influence on my behavior. And looking at these temporal um, variations in people's behaviors and um, health-seeking or non-health-seeking uh, behaviors. And we're also continuing the uh, research in uh, food deserts, uh, exposures in low socioeconomic um, income environments, and um, in fact, anything that anybody w wants to collaborate on. So we're open, we're, we're hoping we can share this with you, and um, if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat>
like I mentioned, uh, Gary needs to go. Uh, here's a question here. Uh, two questions, really. So first one is, which pollution indicators are you giving here? And the second one is, how sorry. Two, two questions, sorry, for, so just starting over with the microphone, uh, which pollutions are going into that? Second is, can you say a few more words about the social network monitoring part? Of sure. This? So, so uh, in case that's not going on on the broadcast, the first question was, um, what pollution indicators are we pulling here? So this is, uh, we're using Air Now, aren't we, as the, the back end for this? So it's, uh, it's a standard um, uh, web API that you can connect to and it gives you um, a general, this is just the general overall um, summation of a lot of different indexes that it gives you for this, but behind it they're collecting levels of PM 2.5, um, ozone, um, anything else? What else are they pulling off? Uh, do you guys remember? Corey, you wrote this bit, so do you remember what else they're pulling off? Uh, ozone and that's all I remember. Yeah, yeah, I think it's just two point, PM 2.5 on ozone. It's reasonably limited. I mean, it'd be really nice to see as, and the spatial resolution isn't fantastic on this, of course, because it depends on the sensors you have. Um, there's actually a project at Georgia Tech where they put the sensors on the back of bicycles and cycle them around town, and I still haven't managed to connect with that project, so if anybody can connect me with those guys, I would like to build the web API that we can pull that, and, and get, uh, maybe we can get uh, them on limes and, um, and that. And the second question was about, sorry, I'll, 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 I'll get the, but yeah, the social networking, um, it's very brutally simple. Um, I, um, I don't really care what people are doing on Facebook and Twitter because those are really lies that we tell other people about how great our lives are. <laughs> but I care about um, uh, who are you text messaging and calling, how long are you calling them for, and does that relative level of social engagement drop over time? What we've seen is that during um, illness periods, your social network tends to contract. This is from earlier work that we've done on uh, H1N1 outbreaks. Your social network contracts, so the number of people you communicate with drops. Um, but it also changes, so it pivots around and you communicate with a different number of people. And the way it rebounds from that is completely different based, uh, depending on the type of illness. So um, we've seen really obvious traits in bipolar populations where they have bursts of interactions and then uh, during their manic phases and then the euthymic phases, they just, uh, they just completely drop to almost zero communication and then it bursts out again. So that's a really obvious indicator. Things like flu, you would have a contraction in your social network and then the number of people you're calling and texting and how many outgoing versus incoming calls will drop. And that will contract for a small period of time, but actually it will bounce back much more rapidly than your recovery because mostly you're okay and you're just bored, so you're trying to interact back with your social network, whether it, whereas in a psychiatric problem, that doesn't rebound back. Um, and you might pivot around to seeking help from another individual. So those are the things that we're trying to monitor within the social network. It's not what you think of as a modern social network. I think of it more as a 1990s social network from the phone. You could have done this on uh, your dumb phone, um, and it would have been a very strong indicator. And I think it's a better indicator in that way. So there was a question over there more of a comment in the interest of cross-hub collaboration. And we discussed this the last time we met. We should connect it to our exposome project, which has a lot richer information about the exposome, API base, and soon to be super notebook cut. Exactly. I would love that. You know, this is um, this is a very simplistic uh, you know um, picture of the exposures that we can get and I would much rather get a, a, a richer both in the house and out of the house as well, because I think a lot of people don't, they either focus on um, in-house exposures or external exposures, and I'm thinking of noise pollution, of, uh, of um, you know, uh, um, CO pollution in the house, uh, mold spores, you know, everything that can affect your um, short-term and long-term cardiovascular health. So thank you for that offer. I'm around, the I'm back in two hours, so. We'll talk about it this afternoon. Have you just looked at, you know, the, instead of just the size of your social network, the quality of your social network? In other words, you measure heart rate, right? And then after a conversation with someone, has the heart rate spiked? <coughs> a difficult conversation with someone at work or with so a close relationship. That is, I think, where much more than whether you ate 
cauliflower and broccoli today, I think it's that kind of stress that affects the heart rate. So um, that, that I think has a short term effect on heart rate, but one of the problems with, um, so I've probably looked at uh, cardiovascular signal processing more than anything else in my life, and one thing that I'm really sure of is that um, there's no way to disambiguate positive from negative stress isn't from a cardiovascular point of view, except when it's extreme and it's causing ejection fraction differences. But in terms of heart rate variability and even repolarization changes, you don't see any, I could be overjoyed at my conversation with you, or I could be livid at you, and it would have very similar reactions actually. They're very strong sympathetic surges which cause very, uh, they cause low frequency changes in your heart rate variability, your parasympathetic system starts to get in inhibited, but they're essentially the same responses. So that is an error of, uh, it, such, it seems like uh, an easy place to try and pull this response in, but the difficult part is disambiguating that, and the second part is trying to measure the physiology um, from anything but a, um, an adhesive patch device. Uh, I said earlier that um, the data coming from your wristwatch is probably largely garbage and, um, in terms of heart rate, and, um, and that's just experience of having yeah, looked at though, millions of hours. You just have to use more signals. So in a, in a smart, smartphone now, you can look at your eyes, you can look at your pupils. So when, when it was an exciting conversation, your pupils actually dilate. Yeah. When it was when you were livid with rage, your pupils actually contract. So uh, you I, just have to take more markers. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you can start to, to drive down a lot of detail on this. You would have to, of course, be measuring ambient light um, changes in case that was changing the pupil dilation. You would also need to know whether your ability to measure the pupils was not a function of any illness you had. So, for example, if you had some diabetic retinopathy or something like that, would that affect your ability? And so you get confounders from the illnesses as well. I think it's a really interesting NSF research project that uh, somebody's going to fund very soon, but I'm not sure if, uh, if it's really very feasible from um, a large-scale monitoring perspective because you've got a lot of assumptions about how people are holding their smartphone, whether it's facing their face. Um, I mean, I, I hold my smartphone at a lot of different angles and I, I use a face unlock. And sometimes I realize that it's not unlocking because I haven't got it pointing at my face correctly. So. And we do a lot of eye tracking actually with, um, with iPads and iPhones. And it's actually not as easy a task as you imagine. So it's um, trying to get people reactivity is going to be is going to be quite a challenge, I think. Yeah, just one example. Um, Maybe it's yeah, some some other biometric. But no, I take your point. But um, and, and it's a conversation that we have a lot with doctors about whether we can identify these individual stresses. So you're talking about um, you know this notion of um, of uh, um, almost um, continuously blogging your environment and looking at the biofeedback from that. Uh, what do they call it, uh, where you're uh, constantly monitoring? Social media. Yeah. I'm th I, forget the, I forget the research um, for um, constantly monitoring your environment, like when you have a, yeah, it's not surveillance, because that, that, that has too many negative terms on it, but it's, uh, um, it's more an anthropological term. I'm blanking on it completely. Gary, thank you so much, thank and you. we'll look forward to having you this afternoon, and thank good luck with whatever's coming next. A slight change on the agenda. Next up, also from Atlanta, Georgia Tech, uh, Santiago Grijalava, talking about smart grids and big data. Did he take the... Hello, can you hear me? Sure. Yep, great. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to um, speak about the uh, Smart Grid Spoke. Uh, my name is Santiago Rijalva. I am the co-PI of this project, which uh, is a collaboration with uh, Texas A&M. Uh, 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 Miladin Kisunovic is the PI of the project, um, with various other folks, uh, 
uh, across the uh, across the country uh, as well. So let me go very quickly on what this project is about and some of the challenges and great opportunities uh, of this particular spoke. So for a century, basically, we have the electricity and energy infrastructure going, moving slowly. And very recently, uh, about 2010 or so, the, the uh, initiatives about a smart grid, which is overlaying on top of the electricity infrastructure, communications and sensors and computation, to make it more modern, flexible, reliable, resilient, so we can achieve a lot of the objectives associated with integrating renewable energy, for instance, solar energy, energy storage, electric vehicles, wind, uh, combined heat power, etc., happening to the grid. So around 2010, there was a lot of investment from the government in implementing sensors in these infrastructure, smart meters at home, uh, having implemented in more than half of the customers, electricity customers in the United States. Here in Georgia, we have 100% penetration from uh, Georgia Power and Southern Company. And at the same time, a lot of sensor is in smart appliances in what is called distributed energy resources, all so the solar PV, energy storage, etc., And other type of sophisticated sensors, such as synchronized facial measurement units, which are uh, very fast sensors that can measure more than 100 times uh, uh, per cycle, per, per, per second, and can provide information about the, the real-time condition and state of the power system. So when uh, big data right, uh, emerged, was very timely because with this new sensor capability, we have new data, uh, f four to five orders of magnitude more data than we had before, much more temporal granularity, a special granularity so we can understand a lot of what is going on with, with the grid. So for, for those of you that are not familiar with, with uh, uh, this electric electricity grid, is everything is interconnected. There are three interconnections. One is the west of the Rockies, another is the east of the Rockies, and the other one is Texas. So when I plug in my cell phone to that outlet, that thing is, can, is interconnected to everything else. And the grid feels in here if a large bulk power plant uh, is disconnected in Michigan, right, pretty much instantaneously. Very fast, very dynamic, uh, dynamic system. So the objective of uh, putting that uh, uh, sensors and communication and data provides a lot of capabilities to understand how we can interconnect renewable energy and address issues such as climate change, more efficiency, et cetera. How can we uh, incorporate energy smarts into homes, buildings, microgrid campuses, hospitals? How can we create ultra reliable en more energy efficiency, military bases, government facilities, et cetera? There's a lot of possibilities, and there's kind of two types of data analytics. One is kind of more easier, right? For instance, forecasting the demand or forecasting uh, prices, et cetera. Uh, relatively easy, can be more data-driven, fully data-driven. But there is the other type of data analytics that really depends on the physics of the system, right? And some of the experiences that we have in trying to combine communities in, in, in data and in power system, in electricity, is that is really this interconnection right, between when we have postdocs and computer science in our group and, and PhDs in, in, in power system, they really need to work together because it's difficult to understand the, the underlying physical models, all the equations and the, that happens in electricity, and at the same time, the science behind it. So fairly, fairly, challenging, uh, fairly challenging process. So we have a great collaboration with multiple centers, uh, some of those uh, uh, NSF centers, multiple universities. A big center is the PSERC, the, the, the Power System Engineering Research Center, which basically groups a lot of the key researchers in uh, more than 15 different universities across the, across the U.S. and uh, leveraging those capabilities, leveraging the current center, le leveraging the Freedom Center, uh, Department of Energy Centers, uh, etc. The, uh, the collaboration is international with uh, various folks in, 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 in Europe, in, in Asia, in, in Brazil, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of possibilities in that, in that area. So the, the spoke is divided in, in various thrust areas uh, associated with 
renewable energy associated with the smart meters and the customer, right, which allow us to, to um, demystify some of the, the myths about, you know, in, in energy management, we say the customer will behave in this way, the customer will do this, the customer will respond. When you see the data and the evidence, it's much more complex. It's much more difficult than, than that. Same thing in renewable energy. Say we're installing solar panels. When you go and see the types of solar panels that have been installed, the types of power electronics, we realize that a lot of the infrastructure uh, uh, is not necessarily what we, what we expected. The same thing with PMU. So we're learning a lot from these new data streams uh, um, from, from, from the industry. The other aspects is synchronized facial measurement. The other thrust was on education and outreach. Um, uh, books are being uh, developed, uh, workshops, conferences are, are, are being prepared that allow us to, to, to move into that direction of create a much more uh, sophisticated uh, uh, overall grid. Um, they, we have developed a number of workshops. Uh, 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 there is a big conference coming on, which is uh, precisely on the, the first conference, uh, IEEE on uh, uh, co-sponsor on the smart grids uh, synchronized uh, measurements. The, the, these PMUs of synchronized measurements are specialized devices that can uh, measure uh, 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 multiple times per cycle of 60 hertz, multiple times per, per second, uh, across wide areas, right, across hundreds of miles. And they are precisely synchronized in order to see what is the phase of the angle between multiple, multiple uh, nodes in the infrastructure. So this will take place in, in May of this year. At, uh, um, that is one of the, the, the big uh, efforts. Another one is the workshop uh, that we're, gonna, we're planning here in Atlanta, which is the Smart Grid Edge Analytics Workshop. The first uh, workshop of this kind, we have a pretty powerful uh, program for that workshop that brings together leaders from industry, uh, 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 academics, and government in order to share the latest on, on in analytics at the edge of the grid, which means uh, renewable energy, uh, smart meters, electric vehicles, smart buildings, and some connections to, to, to smart cities. So this is in, in, in summary or, or spoke projects, a fairly challenging endeavor, a, a lot of thinking about architecture, right? A, what what, is, what are the strategic objectives that the industry as a whole, the overall electricity industry in the country, needs to achieve? How data can leverage those objectives and making sure that we have very clear success metrics, right? Resilience, economy, sustainability, smartness, that we can measure those and making sure that the technologies and initiatives have a very clear mapping from data to function, to move functionality on the grid, and then from that functionality to the strategic objective. So a lot of, a lot of work on architecture, both of the grid, uh, coming from, from physical devices of the way up to markets, and also information type uh, uh, architecture. We see a lot of possibilities. On the next step, right, remember that the grid is a, is a fast dynamic system. We need to control, we have very fast controls from microsecond, millisecond, all the way to daily operation and all the way to long-term decisions. For instance, um, uh, as we're uh, discussing this, as you may be aware, the largest uh, uh, blackout in the United States history happened in Puerto Rico just a few months ago. How can we redesign uh, that whole infrastructure, right? So not to avoid 3,000 uh, dead people, $90 billion, and it's gonna be about analytics, new capability to model and to enable decision making on where to put the, the distributed energy, what type of distributed energy, what is going to be the cost, who is going to own it, uh, etc. So very happy to answer any questions that, that you may have. Thanks. Thank you, Santiago. I think what we'll do, unless there's an immediate question about, we will wait and for the panel discussion. Sure, sure, that of, work, course, Santiago? of course. If you want to hand your microphone to John. Um, and the next speaker is John Verdi, who is from the Future of Privacy Forum. And when he gets mic'd up, yep. he's going to talk he's about collaborative yep. to protect privacy and use data responsibly. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody can hear me? Yes. So, um, 
I am going to be brief. My name is John Verdi. I'm here from Washington, D.C. Um, as we say, I'm from Washington. We're here to help. Um, I am super excited to be chatting with you folks today about an initiative um, that we have started. We are um, you know, not a long time spoke. Uh, we're one of the newer spokes, and we're super excited to be a part of this community. Uh, we're super excited to get feedback on the project and to figure out whether there are points of collaboration. So we're a think tank in Washington, D.C. We're optimists about data, and we're supporters of meaningful privacy protections for consumers and citizens. One of the reasons why um, we're excited about this project, uh, a research collaborative to protect privacy and use data responsibly, is that we have seen any number of meritorious public programs run aground on the shoals of privacy controversies, data protection critiques, um, and have those concerns undermine um, research and initiatives that otherwise could have helped a lot of people. Um, we see this at the federal level, we see this at the state level, we see it in private industry, we see it in the academic sector, but for this project, we are focused on municipalities. Because there are cities and communities, municipal areas across the country, um, some of which are quite large. You know, you think about the New York City region, you think about the Los Angeles region, you think about the Atlanta region, right? Um, these municipal regions are, in many ways, either as large as um, or close to as large as some states, right? But they tend not to be resourced with the kind of data protection and privacy expertise that folks have at the state level. And we've worked with some folks at cities and communities around the country um, to try to improve that, and we've learned a lot. So the design of this project is for us to collaborate with municipal leaders to strengthen their ability to collect, use, and share data in responsible ways. Um, one of the things we heard over the past few years of us working in this space is that municipal leaders did not have a peer-to-peer -peer network in which they could exchange best practices, they could collaborate on overarching projects and, and cross-cutting initiatives, um, and that they could um, share practical tools. And um, this is in contrast to other institutions. So at the federal government, you have the CIO Council. And the CIO Council brings chief information officers from across federal agencies together um, to engage in these sorts of peer-to-peer -peer collaborations to share best practices and to share tools. In the private sector, you have chief privacy officers at companies who come together in, uh, whether it's through IAPP or whether it's through other organizations, to share best practices. And we're building that for leading cities. Uh, the second thing is we're working with our, our friends Metrolab Networks to try to promote academic partnerships. Uh, when municipalities engage in data-driven initiatives, they often collaborate with academic centers. So we're trying to, to work with Metro Labs and others to make sure that privacy is baked in and privacy-enhancing technologies are baked in from day one. Um, finally, we want to make sure that the public understands that when cities and municipalities engage in data-driven initiatives, um, they're doing so in a trustworthy way. So when municipalities are using best practices, when they're implementing privacy-enhancing technologies, when they're doing things in ways that safeguard privacy and maintain the value of data, it's important to make sure not just that that's happening, but that citizens and communities understand that that's happening. Because the misunderstanding and the lack of communication um, can be a real pain point for some of these initiatives, particularly at the local level. So, what have we been doing? We've established the Civic Data Privacy Leaders Network. This is the peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, we've, we've got uh, 14 or 15 cities and municipalities leading folks in the country right now when we're growing. We have uh, folks from overseas, folks in Canada, folks in Ireland who want to be a part of this and we're expanding outside the U.S. to make sure that um, this can be shared with them. But our core focus is U.S. institutions, right? And this is everybody from Seattle, uh, Washington, to Washington, D.C., to Columbus, Ohio, to Nashville, to Portland, Oregon, to New York, to Los Angeles, right? Um, we're helping folks navigate emerging privacy issues. Um, we're providing a forum for them to share practical guidance. And we're helping them work with each other to promote fair and transparent data practices. Uh, we're also working with them on a core deliverable. And this is a privacy risk assessment. 
So privacy risk assessments, as, as some of you are probably aware, are super important tools for companies, for governments, for academic institutions, for anybody who collects and uses data that is either linked to individuals or can be linked back to individuals. And the goal with the privacy risk assessment is not to tell researchers, government entities, or others that they can't or shouldn't be using personal data. Rather, it's to identify what the potential risks are to using this sort of information and what the steps are that can mitigate those risks to help organizations balance the potential benefits and the prospective risks in ways that promote trust in the ecosystem and get buy-in from the individuals whose data is key to driving these projects, right? So we've done something similar prior to, to this work um, where we've worked with cities around their open data programs. These are programs where cities who have a deep commitment to transparency and sometimes are under legal requirements to do so, right, that helps, um, make the data that they hold public. And the idea behind that, in terms of promoting transparency in government, is all well and good. But those open data initiatives also raise questions when governments collect sensitive personal information about individuals. Information about their finances, information about their health, information about their precise geolocation, information about their health and safety. So we've been working with folks on the question of how you identify risks, identify benefits, craft a balance, mitigate the risk, promote the benefits in the open data space for a while. Um, we're taking a lot of those lessons that we learned and we're building those into the privacy risk assessments, which don't just focus on open data programs, but all sorts of programs where municipalities collect, use, and share data. So, Anticipated outcomes and successes. We're super excited about the work. We're moving quickly. We've got great partners. Um, we're hoping to expand the Civic Data Privacy Leaders Network. Um, we're in the process of creating a repository of common tools and expertise for folks to share. Um, we're continuing to socialize and publish um, the comprehensive risk assessment for open data, and we're taking the lessons learned from that to trans, uh, transition to the privacy risk assessment, which applies to non-open data programs as well. Um, finally, we're hosting workshops with our partners. Um, we're always looking forward to collaborating with folks who either have expertise in this sort of research, uh, partnering with municipalities, or with folks who are developing and implementing privacy-enhancing technologies or best practices that can be brought to bear by the members of the network. Happy to take questions when appropriate during the panel discussion, um, and super excited to work with you folks about how we can promote and drive uh, this sort of initiative for our municipal partners around the country and around the world. Thank you, John. And uh, next up, I think we have Frank, so if you want to take your mic and hand it to I'll Frank. I'll do my best. Thank you. Frank Muller Carver, who is a spoke PI from the University of Southern Florida, talking about a topic that we know well at RENCI. There's a lot of work that happens at RENCI in coastal hazards. He's going to talk about enhanced 3D mapping for habitat, biodiversity, and flood hazard assessments of coastal and wetland areas of the southern U.S. Thanks, Shannon. And thank you uh, for inviting me over. Uh, and I want to thank the NSF for the grant that we have and for the, the South Data Hub for getting us to where we are today. So I also want to acknowledge my team and I have uh, three people from the team, two postdocs, uh, so Matt and Tyler and Sebastian, a student, that are here with me. But we have people on the team from Texas A&M, uh, Corpus Christi, and the University of Minnesota. So we also have uh, other people uh, that are at the University of South Florida that are in other departments. So what we uh, propose to do is to use uh, commercial satellite data that is now uh, available and at very high spatial resolution that you can get satellite images now that can be less than two meter per pixel resolution and map the entire southern coast of the U.S to uh, develop a, a, the first ever very high resolution land classification. So we, we want to develop, a, especially interested in wetlands, coastal applications, those shoals that were just mentioned, but in the water. Uh, and we want to then drape the, those land cover maps on top of a high resolution 
topographic map that we would also develop uh, over that entire uh, southern coast of the U.S. Uh, using LIDAR, so uh, laser uh, type of altimetry uh, devices. So we also now have the capability of using the commercial satellite data, looking at stereo pairs to do uh, three, three D, uh, three dimensional topographic modeling just by looking at, at uh, the ground from two different angles from a satellite. So this is the area that we're covering. Uh, the, we're basically the the, the floodplain. We're interested in looking at uh, what do hurricanes do, what what uh, areas are fl uh, prone to flooding, and how the uh, how people have decided to live in what type of areas, what type of vegetation is at risk of further development, and um, and uh, you know how can we help government agencies to to manage this development. So we uh, are going to map uh, this, the two meter resolution data, so we have to acquire the data. We, have to, we entered in a license agreement with Digital Globe. Uh, we're working with uh, NOAA, the federal government agencies that have uh, all the LIDAR data for the U.S., but they have not pieced it together. So it's all different formats and, uh, and, and uh, little snippets of data here and there from different sensors, and combine that also in, uh, into a 3D land topography map. We're also doing very high spatial resolution maps at a local level using a structure from motion, using drones. So for, for very small wetlands or parts of cities, we would, uh, we're using that technology. So where we are right now, we had a team meeting. Uh, we just started in, in August, September of last year, so it's pretty new. Now we discussed project, project strategy. We actually had a test of a drone collection off of Texas near Corpus Christi. And we have now acquired already uh, about 100,000 satellite images. We have 20,000 remaining to collect to, uh, to cover the area of interest. We are working with the government to get the LIDAR data. We have quite a bit already. For example, we have Texas already covered, and we're going to start with Texas. So we started, uh, Texas were, was doing LIDAR projects, and we were in Florida doing the, we were mapping Florida. With this project now, we are now trying to core uh, to work together to see where we're going to map in a systematic way. And so we started, we're going to start with Texas because they have the LIDAR topography for Texas done, and for us it's easy to adapt to that. And we're working with uh, the South Hub to uh, connect to a supercomputer center. We're right now using the University of South Florida supercomputers, but we think that we can uh, crank through a lot more data, much more faster working with TAC, uh, and we're also working with Microsoft Azure. These are examples of the data. Uh, this is an example. This is Tampa Bay. So we mapped all of Tampa Bay at two meter resolution. So this is basically a, it's a land cover map. You can see where's the built environment, what's impervious surfaces, what's a wetland, what's forest, and so on. And this is an example of uh, what we did with a drone off of Texas. So this, this, uh, the width of this is probably no more than about 100 meters or so. It's a very, very, very high resolution. And over here you have something that may be probably uh, 60 miles across. <coughs> and this is an example of the topography data, uh, two, meter, two meter spatial resolution in order of about, about 0.2 uh, vertical resolution uh, using LIDAR data. Uh, and these are acquired by aircraft. So our, our goal is to uh, process all of this. Uh, we're going to run into errors, and so we have to probably reprocess the satellite data. All of these images are independently collected in different dates from different angles from the satellite, so things look different, and we have to have uh, maps that look um, not, li not like a patchwork, so the maps have to be smooth and continuous and accurate. So we're going to have to reprocess data many times, and this is very typical with satellite data. So having a supercomputer where you, where you can do is, is very important for us. And then ha patching all the data together into a, a seamless maps is also going to take some time. Our goal is to uh, distribute the data publicly, so we, we, are not, we are under license, so we cannot distribute the images themselves, but our value-added product, the, the land cover maps, can, we can fully distribute, and that's, that's what people really are interested in. And what we would like to do with, uh, with the hub is um, 
we are for the data, so we have a, we not only have the, the land cover maps, the topography maps at that very high resolution. We would like to work with you to find applications. And, you know, if especially if it, it's useful to people, uh, you know, some of the things in related to health, pollution may of, be of interest. Uh, planning for flooding. Uh, I mean, we know that we build in areas that are easily flooded. We've seen that in Houston. We've seen that in Louisiana. We see it in Florida all the time. So. Uh, why we do that is not completely clear, but th we do it. Uh, so we want to understand biodiversity. It's, it's, we are very interested in carbon uh, mapping, and we know that different types of organisms use and process carbon and nutrients differently. It's not just all carbon. So we want to work uh, the issue of biodiversity uh, using these types of maps and learn how to process big data for other uh, biodiversity applications and if possible not just to the southern coast of the US but to the whole world and so eventually we would like to map vegetation everywhere at that type of resolution and do it repeatedly and right now we can't. Uh, so we look collaboration and, and understanding how we can do that m making these types of how do we apply these types of data uh, we want experience in using supercomputers to do this and then have other groups uh, use the type of tools that we may develop uh, with the hubs and uh, we also look for experience in mining these types of data. So thank you. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate that. So next up, if you can pass to Netaweb Ayalu, who is also a spoke co-PI from Spelman College. And she's going to talk about her project, Integrating Biological Big Data Research into Student Training and Education. Good morning, everyone. I am Mentua Vallejo uh, from Spelman College, a biology department at Spelman. We are a historically black college, uh, just a four-year college, so we only train undergraduates, and we're just uh, 10 minutes down the road, if there's no traffic, of course. Um, and so I am one of the co-PIs of this uh, Education Focus uh, Spokes um, grant. Uh, that is integrating biological big data research into student training and education. And there are four institutions involved. Uh, the main PI, Hong Chin, is at the University of uh, Tennessee Chattanooga. Uh, and then uh, we have other co PIs at Tuskegee, uh, Spelman, and then uh, West Virginia University. So it's a total of 16 PIs. I haven't met individually in person, uh, all the PIs only through Zoom meetings for some of them. Uh, we are also lucky to have uh, three external advisors, including uh, Lou Bross, who is, um, who is one of the authors of uh, undergraduate data science um, book uh, that is released by the National Academies of Science. Uh, Sam Donovan, who is uh, over the CUBES. CUBES stands for Quantitative Undergraduate um, Biological uh, Systems, I think. Um, and then Dr. Hotel from uh, Fisk University, which is uh, one of the small HBCUs that has launched a data science program. Um, and so we are a, uh, first of all, we are a group of faculty who get to do our own research, but we also invest a lot of uh, time and energy in teaching because we're all uh, working at HBCUs or primarily undergraduate institutions, uh, so our teaching load tends to be on the heavier side. And so through this grant, one of the things we attempt to do is to kind of merge the two together uh, and uh, integrate our research with our teaching. And so that means, uh, and as teachers, scholars, we really need to feel comfortable with the um, uh, with, the, uh, with data science in general, with our um, area of expertise. Uh, and then we usually let that trickle into undergraduate research and eventually into upper level uh, courses and eventually into um, introductory biology courses. Um, and so we'll have that do domain expertise and then you know the, the quantitative and the computational thinking built in. But we also have, you know, you know, earlier Renata mentioned that, you know, we have to think of ourselves as that pie. 
with expertise and the discipline and in data science. And in our case, we also have a third um, bar, which would be the education component. And so, for example, myself and uh, my colleague, Dr. Lee, have been participating in the National Academy's Teaching Fellows. Uh, so we've been um, mentees and eventually became facilitators in, in these workshops. We've been involved in developing transdisciplinary teaching modules. So, for example, we'd start a module in introductory biology to first-year students. Uh, that would involve modeling, and they'll take that, let's say, in their calculus courses in math, they'll take that into their introductory um, computer science class, and then eventually they'll really revisit that concept f once they have really integrated all these different you know, disciplinary perspective on that um, topic. Um, and so um, the expertise range in computer science, biology very broadly, anything from uh, ecology, uh, plant digital imaging, um, ecological big data. Uh, I'm myself, I am a plant cellular and molecular biologist by training and I have been incorporating some uh, modeling and bioinformatic um, metagenomic analysis in my work. But one of the big challenges of um, undergraduate education in data science and biology is that the students need to build a um, critical amount of knowledge in biology, but they also need to have some critical amount of knowledge in mathematics and computer science, and they can only take so many credit hours, so how do you really make it happen? So biological and data science, biological big data has been oftentimes in the realm of uh, graduate education. But still undergraduates need to be somewhat data savvy to, so that they are able to move on to uh, graduate programs that are more data intensive. Uh, and so uh, what are uh, the uh, activities um, and the collaborators. So our four key collaborators are going to be Cubes. Uh, Cubes, again, is a platform um, that enables community building around quantitative biology education. Uh, OSU, or uh, Ohio State University, uh, provides EHR data, electronic health records data. Uh, the Jackson Labs provide genomic data. And we also have a collaborator here at Georgia Tech who was supposed to give a talk, I think, earlier, but did not make here, it. Right after you. Oh, okay. He's going to be right after me. Uh, and uh, it's uh, data that mostly deals with um, ecological um, data. Um, and of course, we're connected to the South Hub through the, um, their priority on education and outreach. And some of the main activities we propose are uh, involve uh, workshops. So we will organize a series of workshops. Um, they're gonna have a disciplinary focus uh, or more of a technical focus. And one of the goals would be for faculty to um, um, kind of pick up a lot of skills uh, and knowledge in these areas, but also to uh, develop learning modules uh, with videos. So one of the deliverables, maybe not you know, right away during the workshops, but you know, down the road uh, through online communities to develop videos that they might use in their courses as well. Another thing we, will, we propose to do is to also have hackathons. So the idea is to provide uh, a lot of expertise uh, over a short period of time to faculty who might have re interesting research questions they want to have addressed. Two upcoming workshops are going to happen, you know, the two first workshops are happening this summer at the University of Chattanooga. Um, the first one will be on data wrangling, boot camp in R, and the second one on electronic health records. And so uh, these, uh, this information would be disseminated through the house, house hub. So these will not be just relevant for faculty who do a lot of teaching, but any faculty who actually does some teaching. And then down the road, we will have uh, a hackathon at Spelman, for example, as well as computational genomics. That's an area of interest for several of us in the biology department. Uh, we have faculty who are interested in evolutionary biology type of questions, dealing with um, genomics big data. We have colleagues who do a lot of uh, gut metagenomics. 
and I myself do also uh, a lot of metagenomics of uh, soil organisms. And that is it. I already mentioned cubes. Um, that is going to be a vehicle for um, creating, extending our communities online. And so really kind of uh, the bottom line is that uh, as a group, we hope to be able to uh, create a community, pro uh, share data, and uh, in addition to providing uh, development opportunities. And ultimately, we hope that this will translate into more curriculum uh, material incorporated in um, and that relates to biological big data. All right, thank you. Thank you, Matuab. Appreciate it. And as you said, Ashok Gol from Georgia Tech will be the final presenter. And he is also a spoke PI and his talk is Using Big Data for Environmental Sustainability. Big Data plus AI technology equals accessible, usable, useful, knowledgeable. Thank you very much. Good to be here. I'll keep this very short, but I need more eye contact so I need more smiles, please. <laughs> so can I have your attention for just a few minutes? Thank you. So this is our project. Uh, we consist of about 24 people spread over 12 uh, institutions that include government, Smithsonian Institution, universities like Georgia Tech, as well as industry, IBM. So it's a big consortium. Uh, we humans are part of a living ecosystem that consists of life of many different forms. And this ecosystem is constantly changing. So we ask questions of this ecosystem. So here are some examples of some questions. Uh, if the weather is sunnier and the plants in my ecosystems grow faster, how many more deer can I expect in my area? Questions like this are becoming increasingly important because of environmental issues, including climate change and global warming. Now, professional scientists sometimes have ways of answering these questions. Analytical models for many of these things are not available. But to the degree to which professional scientists have answers to these questions, Citizen scientists and student scientists certainly do not have tools for that. So the question that becomes, in this time of environmental sensibilities, how do we help our citizen scientists and our student scientists learn about ecosystems? So for eco, uh, student scientists, we want them to think like scientists, like real scientists. For citizen scientists, citizen scientists typically uh, collect data, but we want to empower them so they can actually build models of the data they collect. So how do we do that? So uh, we have developed a research assistant. This research assistant uses both AI technology as well as big data that I'll uh, indicate in just a second. So real scientists follow the cycle of you identify a problem, then you create a model for that particular problem, you evaluate the model, you revise it, and this is a sort of cycle of model construction, a very really well understood cycle. How do we create such a tool that can support the cycle for citizen scientists as well as student scientists? So this is uh, a joint collaboration. Smithsonian Institution uh, is providing access to EOL. Uh, EOL is the world's largest database of biodiversity, about 1.75 million biological species, some more than 60 gigabits of uh, data or more. Uh, at the back end is EOL, at the front end are these tools for modeling. And one part of AI has been to connect them together. It's not just a question of pulling the data for me all. Uh, colleagues at uh, Smithsonian, like Dr. Jennifer Hammack and her colleagues, have done a lot of work on making inferences on EOL because the information that modeling requires is not necessarily available in EOL in raw form. So you have to connect a large number of parameter values to get the inference that you really need for modeling. Let me show you some examples of this. So here a student has developed a conceptual model on the left side that uh, about phosphorus went off in the Chesapeake Bay. Now usually students, humans in general, are very good at developing conceptual models. From a cognitive perspective, we are not equally good at evaluating them. So we have built a small AI compiler, AI translator, 
that understands enough about the language of the conceptual model as well as enough of the language of the simulation model, they can automatically generate the simulation for you. So you as a user, as a citizen scientist, don't have to know what differential equations and stochastic processes because of what AI compiler sets up for you. Here is another example. There is a arrangement of oyster bays. This is in, in the con context of aquaculture. And one oyster bay has been contaminated by parasites. So somebody is designing a water arrangement so that the rest of the oyster bays will not be contaminated. And again, you can do the simulation. And if you don't like the way you have designed things, then you can go and change it. Now, EO has a lot of information. But how do you access some of that information? So we use IBM's Watson tool, where you can ask questions like, what do hammerheads of a particular kind uh, eat? And our tool now uses Watson as a backend to pull out your relevant information from the user, from, from Encyclopedia of Life. And that is important because as we are building models of complex ecological phenomena, we don't even know, most citizen scientists, most student scientists, will not even know the basic facts. It's really important to empower them with a lot of information so that they can actually, they can actually do their task. So I mentioned we had two types of users. So for student scientists, this is now a uh, VEDA system, the research system, is actually deployed in the class at Georgia Tech in general ecology. It's now being used. Um, so this is no longer sitting in our lab. For citizen scientists, we have held workshops uh, at Colorado State University as well as at the recent Citizen Science Association meeting in Raleigh. So this is now in the hands of real uh, citizen scientists. Now again, not just sitting in our lab. We have held uh, three workshops, annual workshops. So the last workshop that was held at the University of North Texas, we did a beta release, and I offer VERA as a beta release form to all of you. We have the tutorials, we have the documentation, anyone can use it. Uh, to now to finally come to the most exciting part, this summer we're going to put VERA on EOL. So these EOL websites are getting about 700,000 hits per month. So uh, we have now confident enough in the Avera and EOL ability that we think we can put it publicly. That uh, has a lot of promise. That means we can now do open public large scale science and science education because then anyone in the world can use it in whatever way he or she wants to. And that raises also a large number of challenges uh, things never work the way you plan them to work. So the chances will work exactly the way we think it will work are sort of not very slim. But it raises a bunch of issues. How will people use them? How, what can we do to support them? How can we encourage not just citizen scientists and student scientists, but potentially professional scientists? How can we support them? It raises a whole bunch of issues there. Uh, but we want to appeal to all groups of scientists, as well as teachers and administrators. So for example, at Georgia Tech, we're going to over the summer run a workshop for middle school teachers and at Smithsonian over uh, this summer, we're going to run a workshop for high school students who go to uh, the National Museum of Natural History. Uh, this uh, will do a soft rollout starting on May 1st, and we are, of course, extremely excited about it because this is an opportunity that comes only once in a while. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. So I'd still like to invite the other panelists up to join um, Ashok at the front of the room, Santiago, John, Frank, and Mentoab, so we can uh, field questions from you. I know we're running a little bit late, but we'll still give a chance to ask questions. A couple questions. I might have you pass this back and forth. Two of you can share this. Yeah. Okay, questions for any of the no lunch is coming, but. No questions, no lunch. I like that. <laughs> so this is a pragmatic question. A number of you all are working in fairly large scale groups, but the scope funding was fairly modest. How are you leveraging, other, are you typically leveraging other funding? Yeah, sure. Well, the, we get the data for free through an agreement with the private companies, and we're also leveraging other NSF, uh, NASA, and NOAA projects, uh, certainly. And we beg, borrow, steal data any way we can. No, I think this is really important for NSF to understand is that there's a multiple effect going on here that I think is very positive. Can you repeat the questions, uh, the recording? 
second was, uh, are we amplifying the funding we have received from NSF from other funding agencies? Is that fair? So uh, our, we have received uh, support from IBM, and we have also received internal funding from Georgia Tech to take this more in the direction of environmental climate change and global warming. So in our case, um, it's an educational grant, and the biggest focus is on organizing workshops. So we're not really supporting uh, a lot of uh, PI effort through the grant. Yeah, for, for us, um, very capable, I think, of executing with the level of funding we have from NSF, but um, that has formed the basis for a couple of proposals that are actually out there active and pending right now um, in non-NSF entities, so um, we're looking to expand and, and multiply and build on. Questions in the room? We have a handheld microphone. Lunch must be good. <laughs> we good? Just a quick one, since I oh, but I can always ask, but can you uh, at least just say quickly how you, you mentioned a lot of the ways that people can get involved, and maybe some of the folks that have gone on for a while have products. Um, so we want to encourage people to also look at what products are out there and can be built on your tools, are there any specific tools or things that you would be looking for to add as a collaboration, specifically for your work, um, or th or there's some tools that the community at large can use as well. But what would you like to see uh, if you if you could for the next phase, or what you might be doing for the more current folks, folks or the ones that just started, you know how you how you plan to uh, involve other universities or other types of entities. There's a lot of Maybe just just commenting on that. So in the in the case of electricity, it's related to several several topics. For instance, in the health, uh, the blackout creates problems, exposure to heat wave, things like that. Um, we haven't uh, case of transportation as well. The, the coastal issues of flooding was a problem in, in Puerto Rico, for instance, in Florida, uh, that uh, knocked down electricity. So there is there is con connections. We have work mostly internally in the spoke and not talk too much about across the, the spokes. But uh, I think there are uh, lots of opportunities to do that. The, the IBM aspect also was very interesting. So. <laughs> Yeah, one of the issues that we have had is uh, data storage. The, the amount of data that we're dealing with is very large, and it's not typical for a normal university computer lab to have that type of resource or the university to offer that to us. So we're working with a big data hub to connect to uh, new programs on data storage. The, like uh, I think it's the Open Data Storage Network. Uh, we have to find ways to protect the data because they're commercial and yet we want to use it and stage it in a way that is maybe accessible to other people, especially the products, and then having access to supercomputers and having us learn how to use those devices is, is an important role of the hub. Stan? Just a quick comment. The, the Open Storage Network, which is being rolled out against the Open Data Hub, is actually a very good is meant to complement the hubs, and that does have some significant storage associated yes. with it. I, that there's all kinds of logistics issues, but we're going to make sure that you all have that capability. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I guess uh, one thing I'll just reinforce what Renata said about the working groups, you know, the breakout groups this afternoon are around kind of priority areas, but I encourage everybody in the audience to seek out the current spoke PIs to seek opportunities for collaboration or working together. There's a question here. Just one more question. I want to focus back. Yeah. I want to focus back on the storage. Uh, so currently, what do the PIs use for actual storage solution? Are you turning to IBM for their so for their storage solutions? Are you using Microsoft's uh, cloud storage? Which one? So I think the question for the virtual world was, what are you currently using for storage? You are the IBM, the tools. Uh -huh. 
So storage is a problem, and we do need some help there. Yes, IBM is helping, but IBM's help is much more on the uh, direction of providing access to tools rather than storage per se. Um, so it'll be great if we as a community come with, can come up with some mechanisms so that this data can be stored. In particular, there is the issue, well, in our case, we can put VERA on top of EOL, but we would like this project to continue beyond the duration of the NSF funding. Um, and so how we do that is a, is a question, and that connects with the question of data storage, but it's also slightly separate. So to, to answer your question, I don't know the answer to the question. Well, the way we're dealing with it is we just buy disks. So uh, right now that's pretty cheap uh, to keep the data locally, but to have access to a supercomputer and stage the data, so it's, uh, it, uh, that's really the issue, is how do you put the data in a place where it can be processed and reprocessed and used many, many, many times without going through a relatively slow network like going to my lab. So th that's where the, these new concepts go, where you have a supercomputer tied to a very large data storage facility, uh, which we want to have access to. So that, that's what we're trying to do. So in the, the interim, getting the data and storing it locally, we just ship dates, uh, disks to Minnesota and back and forth with, uh, by mail. Okay, that's still the, the fastest and the cheapest. Beth? Yeah, thank you. Beth Pleli, National Science Foundation, also from Washington, D.C., but I don't ask that question <laughs> that you asked. Um, so, Frank, um, you had mentioned the, the data storage needs. So, are they, um, you know, are these, you know, I get the sense that, that the data that you have that um, is under uh, restriction um, is available to you while you create these land maps. But that's not, you know, I, I, could, for, I could see the land maps being created and released open source, as you said they would, or, or, or released publicly. Um, but then that, that underlying data are being released and, and no longer within your, your, your control. So I guess what is the longevity of that, that need on that larger uh, proprietary data set for your research? Well, that, that's a good question. We're, we're working with the Polar Geospatial Center, so they're a major repository, and so they, they are funded through NSF to map uh, uh, the Arctic and the landmass around the Arctic and Antarctica. And uh, as a side project, we have this, so they are not funded to m store the rest of the world, and yet we would like to work with NSF and NASA to have a publicly available at least for science, uh, a very high spatial resolution data set. It's very slow to get it out of the commercial databases, so it would be nice to have uh, uh, the, the, the world and all the data holdings from these private uh, satellites in a place where you can do science without having to pay for each image. Each image is in the tens of thousands of dollars, and we have hundreds of thousands of images to work with just for the southern U.S., so if you can imagine that the costs escalate very quickly, and so having that access uh, for science would be very important. I encourage NSF and NASA and NOAA, USGS to get together and talk about how you uh, address this issue. So the long-term storage for the product itself is probably not big. But the the layers that we would produce for GIS are relatively small compared to the actual uh, raw data. So. Uh, if we want to keep the raw data available for a long term, so as, uh, to make sure that we can do science 10, 20, 50 years from now, that, that is an issue. And I don't know that private industry has uh, that in mind. They're interested in selling the data quickly and not necessarily in, in long-term storage. So uh, that is something that has to be worked with industry. So many, many dimensions to this problem. Was there one more question? Yes. Can you give me a one-minute infomercial about your hackathon, the audience base, when it is, a link, please? Oh, uh, yeah, well, uh, so the first one would be offered two years from now, so we don't have the details yet. <laughs> but, um, so the idea is that um, my colleagues, faculty at HBCUs, 
sometimes might have a research question but might feel limited in terms of access to expertise and so on. So the idea is to invite um, participants or to invite um, the PIs to submit questions and certain ideas and then recruit um, sometimes groups of uh, students. Um, they might be graduate students. I know we might be working with um, the graduate program in quantitative biology here at Georgia Tech, for example, um, uh, or the bioinformatics program here. So uh, they might be willing to um, um, bring their students uh, who might work on some problem and hopefully solve the problem. Great, well, thank you. Sorry, it would ahead. probably require a lot of planning ahead, right, to really define the problems, identify the problems, and do the recruiting. Please join me in thanking all of our speakers, and I encourage you to seek them out this afternoon. <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to Renata, so I because I have no idea where lunch is. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, so it's right out here. Uh, that's where the lunch is. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, one thing is when we switched over, uh, introduced everybody else, but I did not introduce Shannon. So Shannon is the new deputy director for the South Big Data Hub, and he didn't, he modestly did not introduce himself <laughs> during the time. So he was our moderator for her this time. And so now you have uh, all the time to talk during lunch. I hope you will collaborate and talk to the people that are here. And please join the first two breakout sessions are on education and then on data sharing and infrastructure. So uh, all of these projects that have educational components and resources that are being developed, uh, we'd love to hear about them, see them, and also cross promote them so other people can find them uh, through the hub. And also the data sharing and infrastructure pieces that were talked about, um, we're gonna dive deeper into that about how we could actually collaborate. All right. uh, are they in this room or where are they? Uh, you can eat in here. So you just get the food and you would come back and into this. Uh, the breakouts, this room actually separates. Uh, uh,